All right, I'm going to start. Uh, we've got a lot, of co lot to cover. My name, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Richard Joy. I'm the Executive Director of the Urban Land Institute, or ULI Toronto. And I'm very uh, pleased to welcome you to today's session, Indigenous Toronto, the stories our city paved over. But as we say, but didn't cover over. Um, Today, we are celebrating this time a new book uh, that demonstrates to placemakers that we must aspire to be place keepers in order to uncover and respect the living legacy of this shared and ancient meeting place. We are lucky to be joined by a panel who will help us explore the 13,000 years of uninterrupted Indigenous presence in our, uh, in, in our city, uh, and along with the vibrant culture and history that thrives to this day. As a Toronto region based organization, we acknowledge that the land we are meeting on virtually is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are all treaty people. Many of us have come here as settlers, immigrants, and newcomers to this in this generation and generations past. And we'd like to acknowledge and honor those who came here involuntarily, particularly those who are descendant uh, from those brought here through enslavement. To better understand the meaning behind this land acknowledgement, I recommend a program that ULI hosted with Shared Path last year, 13,000 years of indigenous history in the GTA and why it matters to planning and development. And more recently, last fall, whose land and whose law. The links for both of these will be in the link in the chat box for you to, to follow up on uh, on YouTube. Before we start, some housekeeping items. Everybody will be automatically muted through the session to avoid audio interference. Closed captioning is available. There may be some slight delay and inaccuracy, and we apologize for that. If you have any questions, um, now we're not necessarily going to have time to get the audience questions, but we are uh, suggesting that you submit them nonetheless. Uh, we will send you the uh, email to uh, John Lawrence, our moderator, uh, who's kindly offered to facilitate uh, the questions um, through email to panelists or other possible uh, sources. Um, so, so don't hold back on questions. Just know um, we may not have a chance to answer them in this hour. Um, this is a recorded session. The recording will be sent to you after the session. If you want to uh, comment on social media, please use our Twitter handle at ULI Toronto or the hashtag Ask Great Questions. Today's event and other ULI programming would not be possible without the support of our annual sponsors. And we'd like to say a major thank you to all of them for their support. Now, more than ever, ULI relies on the support of our sponsors who allow us to put on the quality program we do to drive our mission to shape the future of the built environment for transformative impact in communities worldwide. To all of them, again, we say thank you. Now, um, have we got Carolyn King on, on uh, deck yet? Is she with us? Yes, she just, she joined. Carolyn? Ah, okay. So Carolyn, I'm going to then, without much uh, further ado, I'm going to uh, invite you. Carolyn uh, is uh, the chair and co-founder of Shared Path consultation initiative who has become a, a very valued partner of ULI. We've produced now several events, including this one uh, with you. And um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to turn it over to you to, to take the next uh, few minutes to, to speak to the project uh, that, that you've been leading in particular. It's such a great pleasure to have you back I, I, again, I think inside of uh, less than a few weeks. So Carolyn, over to you. Okay, Jimmy Gwich, uh, Carolyn King, member of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and that uh, I've been uh, working in the relationship building um, uh, area for many years, and that uh, I've been, uh, you know, different initiatives, uh, and that uh, the current ones are kind of like related to the uh, um, Toronto, mainly our area, but also our whole treaty area, and that um, the uh, Shared Path Consultation Initiative. It was a group of people who thought that with our backgrounds, government, First Nations, students, academics, lawyers, uh, land use planners, uh, information that we could help with some of the issues that were coming up about land use conflicts. 
uh, with developers, proponents of uh, different projects that may affect the First Nations. So that's why we started and we've become an incorporated uh, charity organization, obviously headquartered in Toronto, and that uh, on the lands of the tree lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and with uh, many other uh, earlier people who were there, the Huron Vendats, uh, the uh, Iroquois Seneca settled there. And then uh, today we have many First Nations who live in the Toronto area. Um, and that, uh, so welcome to all. And that uh, with the idea of, of working with the uh, United uh, Land in Urban Land Institute that uh, we um, we can help build a, a better future, a, re a good relationship uh, of people living together. Uh, my little other project called the Moccasin Identifier. It's an educational tool starting over with the children and, and the general public to create an awareness about treaty lands and the understanding that they are still in place uh, and should be tools that all people uh, like address. And that's, uh, I hope with our uh, stories about uh, Toronto that are in this book, Indigenous Toronto, will help people understand. So appreciate uh, Chimigwech for everyone who's joining today. Thank you. John, I think it's over to you. Uh, John, you're on mute. Thank you very much. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I have to thank uh, Richard and ULI for this opportunity for the speakers to share something about the uh, this book. Uh, so just very briefly, uh, Indigenous Toronto uh, Stories That Carry This Place has been published this spring by Coach House Books. Um, it's, it's a project that took a number of years, um, involved uh, contributions from many uh, different people in the community. Um, the co-editors are Denise Baldock, uh, Minwate Gordon Corbier, Rebecca Tabobondong, and Brian Wright Cloud. Um, and you'll hear from two of them uh, later in this program. So I'm just gonna, um, uh, my name is, uh, uh, so my role in this project is that I was the project manager. I'm the Toronto nonfiction editor for Coach House Books. Um, so let me introduce uh, the three other panelists and then uh, we'll take it from there. So uh, Minwate Gordon Corbier is Ojibwe and Cree, born in Toronto and raised on the Michi, uh, Michiching First Nation. In 2019, she graduated from the University of Toronto with a BA majoring in history and English. She has since been working in the heritage sector with a focus on Indigenous history. Uh, Philip Cote is Anishinaabe, Shawnee, Lakota, uh, Potawatomi, uh, Ojibwe, Algonquin, Minnewa, Mohawk, uh, and is a member of the Moose Deer Point uh, First Nation. He's a young spiritual elder, an indigenous um, artist, activist, educator, historian, and ancestral knowledge keeper. He's engaged in creating opportunities for art making and teaching methodologies through indigenous symbolism, traditional ceremonies, history, oral stories, land-based pedagogy. Citing all of his ancestry, he is Shawnee, Lakota, uh, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, Algonquin, and Mohawk, a seventh generation great-grandson of Shawi, uh, Shawnee warrior and leader Tecumseh and his ancestor Amelia uh, Chetchak uh, uh, is the granddaughter uh, who is the first signer of the Toronto Purchase in 1805. And uh, finally, Rebecca Tabobondong is a media and story creator. She's the founder and editor in chief of Muskrat Magazine, uh, which is leading online Indigenous arts and culture magazine in Canada. Rebecca is also a filmmaker a writer, poet, and indige indigenous knowledge keeper. In 2015, she co-edited, uh, she co-founded a Geechee Dewan Indigenous Storytellers Festival in Wasaking uh, First Nation on the beautiful shores of Lake Huron. Um, and she's also an elected counselor and community member. Um, so with that introduction, and I apologize for the mispronunciations, um, I'd like to direct the first question to Carolyn King. Um, Carolyn, I was wondering if you could briefly describe the Toronto Purchase um, 
and the process for negotiating the settlement in 2010, which you played an integral role in. Hi, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, I was the uh, I was the chief uh, elected chief in uh, 99 to uh, 2000, uh, 97 to 1999. And during that period, uh, we relaunched the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, relaunched the Toronto Purchase Claim, uh, which had started like over 200 years before then, and uh, basically had been in dispute all those years. And that uh, so we asked to. Um, bring that back up and bring it forward under the process. Uh, there, for those that don't know, there's quite the land claim process in, in this country. Uh, the claim, the it, session, section we went under is called a specific claim, which says that you, uh, you agree there was a transaction, uh, but you don't agree with the terms and conditions. Uh, for example, uh, the amount of land taken, the way it was taken, the money paid, uh, and then whether they did proper surveys, uh, all of those lead to uh, the First Nation being able to uh, uh, question the validity of, of, a, of, the, of the claim. They actually started in 1787. There was a second survey in 1788. And it really just started, uh, you know, people don't realize it started out in uh, uh, toward Belleville area in Prince Edward County. Uh, it was one of the areas that they started. If you ever go there, there's a monument called the Carrion Place. And that uh, it was the start of the Toronto Purchase. And that they, um, it was all about moving goods and transportation and getting access to the land and that um, uh, they were not carried out appropriately and that we were able to relaunch the claim. Uh, in 2010, we had an actual settlement of it. Uh, there was a vote in a referendum in the community to accept uh, uh, $142 million in land claim settle uh, settlement uh, and that and the community did and that um, there was also additional claims on with that, what's called the Brant Track um, was settled uh, as well. And so the, that has, uh, you know, that money is in a trust uh, that the community can access the, the um, proceeds from it on an annual basis. And that has helped the community do a lot of things that they may never have been able to do. But yes, the Toronto Purchase uh, is a significant claim, took over 200 years to settle and that, uh, we're looking at other claims in the Toronto area, Rouge, the water claim that goes right out to the, the international border in the water. They never did say that they were taking the water. They said that they were taking the land. And in some of our treaties over on, around Etobicoke, it basically says that we had access to one mile on each side of the, the river there, um, the Etobicoke and then the credit. And they, it just never worked out. People, they just sold it off, took it, settled on it. And so those things become uh, points of uh, um, discussion or dispute and that we're still looking at those, the further claims. So that's part of the work of the Mississaugas and um, I think that's all I can say on it. You can go to the Toronto Purchase, there's a website for the Toronto Purchase and the claims, the Mississauga First Nation website has uh, all the details of the land claim in there as well. So if you have an interest in it, by all means, check it out. And, uh, any one of us can help you answer some of the detailed questions that you have. Jimmy Gwich. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, uh, one of Carolyn's neighbors and colleagues, uh, Margaret Salt, um, wrote an account of the settlement of the uh, Toronto Purchase claim, and it's part of the book. Uh, another aspect of the book is um, a, a, a description of how um, Indigenous history has been brought forward and, and associated with places um, in the contemporary city. And uh, Rebecca Tabubondong was very integral to some of this act, some of this process, uh, beginning with something called the Great Canadian Bus Tour um, or the Great Indian Bus Tour. And, um, and I want her to talk about its role in connect, connecting Indigenous history to this specific, to this specific region. unmute myself here. <laughs> Meek which um, hello everybody, Rebecca Tabalbarang Indigenous Wasoxing Donjaba Amik Dodem. I am from Wasoxing First Nation, um, just about two and a half hours north of Toronto and um, I am Beaver Clan and um, 
yeah, I um, want to speak and share um, just about, you know, how wonderful it was to be a contributor and editor, co-editor for um, the Indigenous Toronto book. And um, when I first was thinking about what I might uh, contribute, what stories uh, would be part of the book. Uh, for me, one of the first things was the story of the Toronto Native History Project, which began out of the Native Canadian Centre um, in Toronto um, by a visionary and um, activist, academic, community leader who has now since passed on. Um, his name was Rodney Bobby Wash. Um, so for myself, um, my father's side is Ojibwe Anishinaabe and my mother was actually born in Holland and I spent 10 years um, as a teenager on the west coast and um, at that time I really wanted to reconnect to my father's side of the family my indigenous roots and identity and of course this was in the 90s when very next to no education um, included Indigenous um, stories, Indigenous history within the public mainstream school system. So I knew, you know, very little about my own uh, culture and identity. And of course, uh, you know, very few people within the mainstream knew about, um, you know, even basic history about Indigenous people. So, um, I transferred uh, to the University of Toronto and um, one of the first people I met was Rodney Bobby Wash and at the time he was um, the director of the Centre for World Indigenous Studies or the Centre for World Indi yeah, Indigenous um, Studies I believe that was the name um, and also uh, had been the former director of uh, First Nations House at the University of Toronto and one of his main um, goals and uh, things that he engaged in was welcoming Indigenous community members into these spaces, students and um, activists and just anybody really um, who had an interest in um, our community and building community. And um, he was also um, very, much uh, valued uh, education and saw how important it was and how much it lacked um, in, uh, in our society at that time, but especially in Toronto and within the education system. So he was, uh, um, had a great sense of humor and a very creative person. And he came up with the, his brainchild was a popular education program and uh, called the Great Indian Bus Tour of Toronto. And they would, um, we would rent uh, school buses and um, invite anybody to come on. I think uh, there was a ticket purchase of about $15 or pay what you can. And it was a five hour tour. And um, we would travel across the city throughout uh, downtown Toronto to Scarborough, uh, West Toronto and visit significant places. Um, and actually Phil Cote, who's here today, over the years has been a large contributor as well to um, these tours as uh, serving as a tour guide. And um, so some of the stops would be uh, going to uh, Casa Loma, which is at the top of uh, Spadina, um, Spadina Road and so some people may not know the the indigenous history of that area is extremely significant. Spadina itself is actually an Anishinaabe word which means um, an area going up the hill and so as we can all envision Casa Loma at the top of <laughs> this hill with this you know vista of um, of the landscape below, it was a natural and, and perfect place where Indigenous people would often use, it was a regularly frequented camp site and uh, gathering place. And um, so we would point out things like that. Uh, we'd 
go uh, visit the Native Canadian Centre, which was, you know, for many years the heartbeat and still is of the Toronto uh, Indigenous community, where so many of our um, community organizations were first formed. And um, so it was uh, a great um, tool that really exemplifies um, the passion of the Indigenous community in Toronto to learn about our own history in the face of a reality where um, it was never included that for the past uh, 400 years Indigenous history has been really uh, systematically buried and through settler colonialism that includes the reservation system and uh, forced residential school system. Indigenous people have really in Toronto and beyond taken a huge measure to um, unearth their own histories and to share that not only within our own communities, but the larger non-Indigenous community um, through really amazing projects like this. And so now today, um, the history project still continues. The bus tours also still continue, but they've evolved. They're now, they're cycling tours and walking tours. Um, the name is called First Story Toronto. And I think they wanted to be a little bit more PC with the name, but um, it's uh, something that's really has grown. And um, there is a lot more indigenous content of information um, that's been documented and published, you know, since the founding of these tours. And um, I think that even this book being published now and the people participating in our audience today, you know, really shows that um, we're at a different uh, point in our relationship building and shared history of wanting to understand who we are and what our histories are. So I just uh, think that uh, this book, you know, just touches the surface of that. There's so many wonderful stories and uh, so much to learn from them. And so that just little slice there is uh, uh, the Toronto, uh, Great Indian Bus Tour of Toronto. Thanks very much, Rebecca. So um, the next speaker is Mingwate. Uh, so, uh, the editors uh, met Winwate when she was uh, uh, working for Heritage Toronto. And uh, Carolyn will know this story too, that at a certain point, it dawned on Heritage Toronto that the history of the city really doesn't be begin in 1793 or uh, with the French fort earlier in that century. And it goes far much further back. And so there was a need to, you know, to incorporate other histories and deeper histories. And so Minwate was developing content and walking tours for that. Um, and one of the things that um, we did in this book is to acknowledge that history is not just, you know, way beyond living memory, but um, contemporary social history and of which there's a great deal in the city. And so uh, one of Minwate's uh, chapters in the book is about a woman named Verna Johnston, um, who played an important role in, um, in helping young people who were coming to the city. Uh, yeah, hi everybody. Um, could you put my slide up please? Thank you. <laughs> so uh, Verna Johnston uh, ran a boarding house for indigenous youth in the city. And it was really the first um, indigenous run boarding house for indigenous people in Toronto. Um, so it was really kind of like a, a safe space for these youth who really uh, maybe might have experienced some culture shock or kind of some isolation or disconnect from their community because for most of them it was really their first time ever uh, living somewhere else besides the reserve. So Verna really tried to be uh, kind of like an elder figure for them and really kind of smooth that transition from reservation to this new urban area that um, was yet to be really familiar for most of these youth. So uh, as you can see in this picture, she did a lot of cooking. She would often cook uh, 
kind of like reservation favorites like scone and uh, buffalo stew and things like that to really kind of uh, kind of have that um, that home feel while you're away from home. So she did things like that. She cooked and cleaned the house so that it was a bit easier for these students. Most of them were students, some of them were uh, working, but most of them were going to Toronto for post-secondary education. So she really kind of made the, the house a really uh, relaxing place for them. And she also helped them out, gave them some counseling, connect them to services in the city uh, to really be kind of that guidance for them. Um, because she herself, when she was younger, she had moved to the city by herself after leaving her husband and she really knew how isolating it could be and how um, different it was to life on the reserve and how um, people would need some kind of connection to their uh, culture and to their community in a place like Toronto that was so urban and had so many different people and different experiences than uh, what they were familiar with. So she really wanted to prevent her own uh, feelings of loneliness that she experienced from continuing into the next generation. So I think that's really why she started this boarding house and why she wanted to um, help the next generation. So I would say uh, there's a couple other grandmother figures that we fit feature in the book. There's also uh, Millie Redmond and Pauline Shirt, And I would say they're kind of like Verna in that they really wanted to <clears throat> make things better for the next generation and really have kind of a safer place in the city that uh, Indigenous youth can uh, go to and really uh, still feel that connection to uh, their Indigenous culture in Toronto. Um, so I would say Verna and Pauline and Millie really uh, wanted to help out and wanted to uh, make a difference in their community and through that they uh, definitely kind of changed the Indigenous community in Toronto that we know today. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm gonna post uh, an article, uh, which is an excerpt from the book by Miles Morriso about Millie Redmond um, that was published in the Star in the chat in a moment. Uh, <clears throat> so because uh, many of the people who are tuning in today are involved in uh, city building and uh, development, real estate and placemaking, um, we wanted to invite uh, Philip Cote to participate in this conversation because his, his art, his mural art is, uh, is among the most visible mural art and uh, ways of communicating uh, sort of traditional stories and traditional um, uh, imagery to a very contemporary city. And this is done through, you know, uh, mural arts in public spaces like on Spadina Road near DuPont and in development contexts. Um, and so, uh, so Phil, I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit about this work and about how you uh, approach this this idea of connecting um, these spaces with the stories that are represented in your art. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Um, I think most of you know me on the panel and uh, probably lots of the audience out there knows me. I've been around the city my whole life and I'm one of those uh, community members that has seen all different parts of our community from the Native Center and all of the social functions that have happened over the years. And, uh, you know, as an artist, uh, you know, uh, one of my goals was to begin to talk about culture and talk about uh, what our, uh, our history was or where do we come from? How do we end up here? And all of those are important questions uh, when creating works of art. And uh, so a lot of my, um, my, my experience and understanding uh, is just accumulated over time. Uh, you know, one of the first big murals that I did was for the Mississaugas. I did a thousand square foot mural for them uh, talking about the creation story of the Anishinaabe. And so that's a point where I became very, uh, uh, I got a really interesting, 
intimate understanding what that story was about through Edward Benton Benet. And uh, he was one of those uh, Anishinaabe uh, Madewan elders. Uh, and uh, he was the leader of this Madewan society. He wrote this book back in uh, the eighties uh, with the intention that uh, most of the community did not know how to speak indigenous. And so therefore they wouldn't hear any of these stories unless they could speak that. And that's what the Medewan society is all about, is about you know, uh, maintaining those ceremonies and they're all done in the indigenous language. And most people who were separated from the culture uh, through no fault of their own, of course, through really the residential schools or maybe even their parents were victims of residential schools, lost this connection to language and lost the connection to being able to tell the story. So these are kind of the, this um, born from that idea is transmitting that story across the land uh, visually uh, through um, uh, a great uh, and deep technique uh, known as woodland style painting. And for me, uh, you know, this is a much, much deeper uh, um, story than people even imagine. Uh, Norval Morriso was another one of those bright figures from our community. You know, he wasn't a perfect human being, but he made these beautiful creations telling our stories. And uh, for the first time, many people being able to hear and see what indigenous culture was all about. These stories come from our communities and Yes, he didn't have to speak it in his language, even though he knew how to speak it. And he began to tell the stories to uh, the mainstream audience, which began to change everybody's vision of what and who the Anishinaabe people were. And, uh, you know, he became so famous in the 60s. He was the first one to really begin to tell our stories out in public spaces. And uh, there's a lot of reasons why these things kind of uh, happened in this order. And it because uh, Indigenous People, most people or most Canadians don't realize that Indigenous people didn't even have the right to vote until around the 60s. And that's what changed everything. And so Indigenous people at that same time were, uh, were taken off, uh, the, you know, their culture practice was taken off the unlawful books because it was outlawed for Indigenous people to speak their language. It was outlawed for them to congregate in large groups. It was outlawed for them to practice their ceremonies. A lot of people don't realize that Indigenous people had a lot of obstacles trying to be Indigenous. They weren't allowed to. So these visual images were the beginning of telling that real story. And uh, this story in particular is the arrival of the first man and woman and how they kind of uh, got here. And it's that story, that moment, uh, you know, after the first man had arrived and had been created uh, from the four elements of the earth. He was brought down to earth and then he goes to visit the, the, uh, the firekeeper in the east and the firekeeper in the east has a daughter and they become this, the birth of uh, humanity in North America. This is what the story really is talking about. And then of course the cosmology of the Anishinaabe is portrayed throughout this image here because you can see those kind of black lines connecting all the animals to the people and even to those, uh, you know, those uh, spiritual uh, elements within our with our storytelling, like the Thunderbird there on the on the left, and uh, they're all connected together, because in uh, Anishinaabe cosmology it talks about um, uh, the beginning of the universe, and that being that um, that there was a great spirit in the center of this dark void, and that spirit sent out the signals. And then when there was no response, the spirit calls the signals back and says, create light in the universe. And at that moment, all the stars were born. So then we had light and dark in the universe. And that's the, that's the core of Anishinaabe cosmology right there. Because in that moment, they talk about everything being related because everything is made of the light and dark. That's where this story is talking about. This is a really important story. And, uh, you know, and, you know, when people look at it, they look at the beauty behind it, but they, uh, then they got to ask the question, what does it all mean? So this is a perfect opportunity for people to learn about the culture. I know there's a website uh, by Center Court Condos and anybody can go and take a look at the whole story. I write uh, um, 
you know, the stories behind these images so people can understand what they're looking at. And I'm breaking down our cosmology and our history in the process of, um, you know, trying to get all the, all the points covered so that people can begin to uh, understand uh, the Indigenous people and their story on this land. So, and uh, of course, you know, the story is in the book, so you can read it, the whole story about this image. And I think that's kind of like um, my, my connection with the, you know, this art that's going across the city of Toronto. Uh, it's, it's there because, uh, you know, as a child, I never saw a reflection of my identity and myself, my community anywhere except on, you know, on cars, you know, you had some cars that were, had indigenous names on them. And every once in a while, you, you know, you always saw the cowboys and Indians on those old movies on TV, but you never saw the portrayal of these people by those people. We always have a portrayal of these people from the settler vision. And uh, for me, I, I, I never thought much of myself as a child, but I was always curious. And I remember seeing more so, uh, his work in the newspaper on a Sunday morning back in 1967 and I asked my father who that was and he said he's one of us and uh, I thought that was fantastic there there we see I finally saw a reflection of our community through Morriso art and coincidentally I was living on Baldwin and Beverly and Morriso was living at uh, Baldwin and and uh, McCall so I would walk by his house every morning on my way to school uh, back in the 60s, which was incredible. And of course, later on, I had an art show with him in Santa Fe, New Mexico. At the time, I wasn't a painter, but I was a sculptor, sculpting soapstone. And uh, yeah, so those are a lot of close calls. And uh, I just think there's a connection. Uh, I lo do love the storytelling. So can we turn it to the next slide? I think there's a couple here, right? Yeah, so this is a recent, uh, this just happened like last month, I, I was working on this mural. This is for uh, Red Door, it's a shelter, family shelter, and they wanted the stories of the seven grandfathers. This was my idea to bring in the seven grandfathers without showing the grandfathers, because each one of those grandfathers is represented by an animal, it's represented by colors. You know, and here's this one, this, this is truth and wisdom. Uh, these are the two animals that are represented in the seven grandfather teachings. And it's done on the outside of their building. It's running along an alley uh, down at the east end of Toronto, down by um, Booth and Queen Street. So anybody who knows the east end of Toronto knows where that is. And uh, it's a woodland style painting, of course. And uh, I have um, visions here of the underworld. Uh, we're on the edge of the underworld because we have this fish on this part of the mural and um, you know a lot of uh, our stories about the cosmology talk about the edge of the underworld being along the water and so water has always been this connection in our cosmology that takes us and uh, and i guess our our thoughts and our imagination have to be kind of jolted into begin to think about the dynamics of what that really means when you say the edge of the underworld and that means the spirit world so, you know, I'm giving little glimpses of this, uh, what, what Anishinaabe cosmology is all about. And these bright colors that you see across the image, they are the seven grandfather colors. And so, you know, I do teachings with uh, school kids and I talk about the colors and their, what they represent, that they do represent each one of these attributes of the seven grandfathers, which I think is really important. So let's switch to the next one. And I don't want to take up too much time. This is like, I'm trying to keep it compact as, <laughs> as much as I can. But this is the interior of the building. So it's a play area for the, the kids to hang out in. And it's a safe place for them to be while they're in this transition moment. Because, you know, it's not a permanent residence, but it's just put there to help people to this in between moments from, you know, getting their own place. And this is a safe place to be. So I, I have the, you know, the different ones that represent here you can see that there's a there's a wolf down there representing the let me get my board hold on OK, 
Okay, so you guys are getting the 101 treatment here. You can see the uh, seven grandfather teaching. You can see where the wolf has uh, its uh, color is violet and its humility. And, you, and the bear and the buffalo, the bear was the bravery and the buffalo was the, uh, was the respect. And then you have in here, you have the, you have an otter again, and I don't, I didn't have a place for the otter, but I wanted the otter to be part of the story here because it was uh, representing a really important time. And, uh, and this time was about how the medicine wheel teachings came to the Anishinaabe and it came in the, through the form of an otter. And the otter spoke to that first human and, and shared the knowledge behind that, the medicine wheel, what it was all about and for. Of course, we can't talk about all that now, but I just wanted to point out these simple things that are important. So this is one of my uh, teaching boards and uh, that I work with uh, elementary school kids and high school kids and I talk about our culture and just try to break it down into simpler forms where they can begin to kind of uh, create their own dialogue, how they see things and, and how they can understand how the indigenous people think about things. So let's go to the next slide. There's one more. Okay, so this is the front of the building. You can see the bear and the buffalo, so bravery and uh, bear and the buffalo, kind of bravery and respect. So, you know, this is, uh, of course, it's woodland style painting and these circles were to represent those different colors behind each of these animals. So you can see that the bear has the red kind of like uh, circle on the inside and you can see where the buffalo has the black connecting it with each one of these seven colors and so what's great is that the seven colors are all over the mural and it's uh kind of it's really light and uh it's friendly looking and um it's a it uh has already had so much comments in the community everybody's so happy with the mural being on their street and they said they feel good just walking by it. And I like that idea that, you know, not only is the work educational, but it makes people feel good, even if they don't understand the whole story. And at some point, they're going to, um, a plaque's going to get created so people can go and look at it and then look at what the animals are. And then they can start relating the, the words and the knowledge to each one of the figures that are painted on here. I don't know if there's one more, but. Uh, check if there is another image. Okay, well, yeah, this is a great one. This is for uh, Carolyn, I guess. But uh, yeah, that's my design there. Right there, that moccasin, I did that from research at the uh, at the Bath Shoe Museum. I, I was yes, that is Phillips. <laughs> I was working for Carolyn. <laughs> and uh, this is the uh, work that came out of that uh, research at the Badish Shoe Museum. It was a very exciting project. I was really happy to be part of that, Carolyn. But anyways, uh, I'm going to call that a day. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for that. That was great. And uh, I, I have to say that I passed by a couple of these murals when I'm out walking my dog in the mornings. And um, it's great to be able to sort of read into the images and understand them. Um, so uh, this was an excellent segue, Carolyn. Uh, Carolyn has uh, founded um, this the Moccasin Identifier Project, which is also about placemaking and about connecting the past to the present. Um, and so, Carolyn, can you talk a little bit about this uh, about this initiative? Okay, thank you very much. And uh, yes, that is uh, Philip's work. He he. Philip was our researcher. Well, he did a mural, that's how we met, and maybe things before then, powwows and different things. But uh, we've known Philip a long time, and uh, him and his partners there, they, they do the, did the mural at our Lloyd S. King School, which has now become part of the curriculum, and even our own school. The uh, um, moccasin identifier, um, well, Philip was our researcher, our artist, our um, stencil maker, and that uh, we've taken. Uh, uh, which case the moccasin identifier was born out of a digital project where we were looking to use technology to identify significant sites for our uh, our community, our First Nation, and that uh, it uh, uh, it kind of came to a drop end because we ran out of money. But um, we continued where it it evolved into a stencil, a school stenciling project where they're actually you get a stencil 
And uh, as you see, I got a little the board up behind me. But in this here um, document, you get the um, um, little, what we call the kit. And there are four stencils in there. They're a little bit flimsy, but uh, we have four stencils that uh, uh, representing the four the four groups linguistic groups in Ontario, and that's where we get the uh, the uh, Cree in the north, the Wendats in the middle area, Nishnabi kind of all over uh, the southern part of Ontario, and the uh, using the uh, uh, Seneca uh, Iroquois ones for they moved as part of a historical context. Why we fixed the Seneca one? They, they were the ones moving into southern, the foot of southern Ontario from the United States, and that uh, so in the future it'll be everybody's moccasin as we keep working on designing more. But the core project has been the educational kit, and we've uh, finished that. If you go to our website moccasinidentifier.com, and that uh, you can see the the work that we've done in the pictures, and this is our or what we call our signature site uh, that we worked with the Ministry of uh, Culture and Tourism and Sports and, and that uh, they were looking to re redevelop uh, Ontario Place and uh, we we were contacted as part of the treaty treaty partners there and that uh, uh, I was the lead on on the project uh, to redevelop the the uh, help redevelop the Ontario Place which is now called the uh, Trillium Park and it has the William G Davis Trail and I encourage everyone to go visit that space. Um, it represents, a, just like Philip's murals, um, it represents something in our, our people's uh, connection to the land. You know, our footprints on the ground, our uh, connection to the water, our connection to the indigenous plants that are now there. And we're in the midst of plaguing all of them with the Anishinaabe name, uh, the English, French, and the, the Latin name. So that'll be easy for people to understand what those plants are. And that how 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 to use them even we hope to have lessons and stuff like that. There's a fire pit there where we can have just a regular fire gathered around, or in our case we might want to have a sacred fire. And we have the winding paths, and we have the marker tree, uh, which is about giving direction, an indigenous way of giving. Uh, um, you want to call it wayfinding. Um, back to the, the marks and identifier evolved, like I said, from the digital dot to the stencil making project we're doing today. And that uh, uh, it is getting great traction. I'm uh, uh, happy to say that it is it has been overwhelmingly accepted by the school systems that we've been in. We have done thousands and thousands of kids. And so I'm getting pretty tired doing all this. So we're trying to figure out how to, how to expand it out there and build a network of people who will take up the cause of marking the, putting the moccasin identifier down all of Ontario, uh, no doubt the southern part that's the most populated needs to really be reminded that there were people here before them and that uh, people have taken up the uh, families have taken uh, the stencil and went and stenciled their sidewalk and asked people if they could stencil their whole street. And so we're so happy with that and we'd like to see more of that and our networks are coming together. We're doing some great work with them. Credit Valley Conservation, uh, we're just in-depth in talks with Toronto Regional Conservation because all of the Indigenous people, our connection was to the land and to the water. And that, you know, all those waterways can be, uh, uh, tell our story of uh, living, uh, moving and honoring the land. So I just think that there's, a, uh, I'm in love with the project so I can get all excited about it and uh, what we're going to do. And that, uh, like I said, our, our goal is to put some permanent markers on the ground Maybe not as big as this one at Ontario Place, but definitely other places in all of the treaty area. And then as we move on to all of Ontario, it would be, um, I say, I have a, I have a dream too, I, that Ontario will be covered with moccasin identifiers in the next decade. And that they will always be reminded about whose land we're on. Join us. Jimmy. Okay. Thank you so much. It's, uh, and that walk down, your Ontario place is amazing. Um, uh, and I'd highly recommend it. Uh, so uh, next to switch to something uh, quite different, um, Minwate has a chapter in the book about a guy named Dr. O who uh, left quite a different imprint on the city um, uh, 
uh, when he was when he was active professionally um, earlier in the century. Yeah, so uh, Dr. O was kind of um, one of the first Indigenous public figures really in Toronto in the Victorian era. He was kind of, um, at least for that time, kind of the first Indigenous man that was sort of famous in the city. <laughs> and that was during the Victorian period when um, a lot of the kind of mainstream uh, Canadian society wasn't really familiar with Indigenous people at all, really. Um, so he was actually the head or the Supreme Chief Ranger of the I Independent Order of Foresters, which was a fraternal society that also offered uh, insurance benefits to all its members. So <clears throat> before he joined, uh, he was a doctor. He got his uh, um, MD at uh, U of T, and he was one of the first Indigenous MDs in Canada. Um, and I think it's really through his work as a doctor is why he wanted to join the Independent Order of Foresters, uh, because he saw through his practice that people were in need of insurance and the importance of having insurance for uh, the Canadian population. So while he was there at the ILF, he really kind of turned it around at the time that he first joined, there was around uh, less than a thousand members. And then by the time he was kind of, uh, by the time uh, he passed away, it was up to 250,000 members. So he really kind of took what was a, a struggling uh, society, paternal society and kind of rebuilt it and made it one of the top fraternal societies in Canada. So one of the things he did uh, as the leader was to create the temple building, which became the headquarters. Uh, so could you put my slide up, please? With the picture. <clears throat> so this was the temple building that was the headquarters for the IOF. So they had office buildings and um, like gathering halls and it really kind of uh, cemented the IOF's uh, position in Toronto and really in Canada as a whole for having this uh, building, which was actually Toronto's first big skyscraper <laughs> at the time. And for a few years, it was really the only uh, skyscra skyscraper in Canada. Um, but unfortunately, it was uh, torn down in 1970 and uh, we really kind of lost that permanent reminder of Dr. O with this building. Uh, but he still kind of uh, lives on on the surface of the city today because there's a street named after him called Dr. O Lane. And he also has a plaque for him, which is outside of uh, Ms. Webby headquarters. So even though we lost the building, he's really still a part of the city today, I'd say. Thank you very much. So we have just a little bit of time left. So I'd like to ask Rebecca to talk about the work of another um, Indigenous physician, uh, Dr. Janet Smiley, um, and who was responsible for a project called Our Health Counts. Um, and uh, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Rebecca. Okay, Miigwech. Um, it, yeah, it's just so great to hear all the stories of um, of creating more Indigenous presence in the city. And um, really, uh, you know, that it is undeniable that Toronto has such a rich Indigenous history and culture uh, to contribute within every sector of our society. Um, for myself, one of the um, things I, have al I also do is uh, engage uh, community research. And so for, Several years I worked with Dr. Janet Smiley. We worked um, at St. Michael's Hospital um, at the Well Living House, which is an Indigenous Action Research Center. And um, one of the projects uh, that uh, we initiated was Our Health Counts Toronto. And, you know, what uh, was a huge issue for city planning um, was identifying who 
are the indigenous, what is the indigenous population of Toronto? How many people <laughs> live here? Who are they? Where do they live? And there was next to, you know, virtually no data on this. And um, so for example, um, the, the last Canadian census that uh, many planners were working with were from the, from 2011. And uh, only 14% of Indigenous adults in Toronto actually completed the census. And so, you know, a representative sample would have required 70% of households to complete the census in order to, um, you know, have some, you know, meet to um, these, uh, this, the stats and to be able to move forward. So, um, obviously, uh, the city was not connecting to the Indigenous population. And so um, this was the first uh, survey, largest urban Indigenous survey ever conducted um, by Indigenous people for Indigenous people. And it was a study, it was a collaboration, it involved, as I said, the Well Living House and also seventh generation midwives of Toronto. And so the difference was, is they took an inclusive community driven approach and the research basically painted a more reflective picture of the urban indigenous population of Toronto. And so one of the findings that came out of it, there are many interesting findings, which are, um, we have here in the book highlighted, but um, according to the study between 34,000 and 69,000 Indigenous people live in Toronto today. And so prior to that um, statistic, um, Canada's 2011 National Household Survey had grossly underestimated Toronto's Indigenous population at 15,650. And so obviously this uh, discrepancy, um, you know, has very negative uh, impacts um, as I said, across sectors and providing um, health services or um, education, et cetera. So this uh, really speaks to um, in the area of health, in the area of um, research and data, like how important it is to include in the Indigenous community and have Indigenous people really be at the helm of um, identifying um, and articulating our community and what our needs are in the community. Rebecca, thank you so much. So, uh, Richard? Yes, well, I want to thank everybody. And I, I, first of all, let me apologize to the audience. Um, I teased you all and said that we would be getting to your questions. Um, and, and we got to some really great content. So we didn't, but we did promise you that we would reply. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, take these questions and we will be uh, sending back to all of you uh, the answers. So some really, really important questions. And one theme I felt was uh, we have a lot of city builders uh, on this call and they're all trying to understand how they can be better, not just as I said in my introduction, place makers, but place keepers. And um, how can we find a greater and deeper and more meaningful intersection uh, is something that I think you can count on ULI as wanting to explore, but that was definitely one of the big themes and the questions that came through among others. I want to thank, uh, I would first also, also want to apologize, Carolyn, I, um, my script disappeared on me just as I was introducing you and I didn't properly introduce you. Um, I did put it in the chat, but uh, it, 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 I, among the many other things uh, that Carolyn's been honored for is uh, recently uh, become a member of the Order of Canada as well. And, and, and I should have mentioned that at the beginning. Um, and of course, everybody I think knows John Lawrence um, as uh, a, a, a one of I really the city's best journalists uh, uh, covering so much of the city that none of us would know about but for John. So John, thank you for that. Uh, Menowate, Philip, Rebecca, and again, Carolyn, thank you for today. Um, terrific programming. We're going to be back um, into uh, more programming, uh, it, you can count on that in the future, especially with the, our, our partner Shared Path. Um, I believe you have a, a slide staff just to uh, go to point to some future upcoming events. We're doing a lot of programming um, and uh, please uh, take a look at it. Uh, I'll flag that uh, we're cooperating with a number of organizations to uh, present uh, uh, Douglas Cardinal uh, in, next week. Um, many of you will want to uh, check, it, check out that. 
uh, and some more upcoming events are on the link that just got posted by uh, Crystal. So thank you, Crystal. So with that on time, I bid you all uh, a good uh, Friday and a nice weekend, and we'll look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you.